play and call it work. Mini Wargamer Dave here from MiniWargaming.com. Our friends over at CreatureCaster have launched a campaign for Eternal Champions Judgment. As a player, you will take on the role of whichever god best suits your playstyle. You will then assemble a warband from the vast assortment of unique heroes who will support your cause. In this battle report, Luca and Cullen will be the players. They're going to be faced off against each other. They'll be battling it out. Throughout the course of the game, you'll see exactly how to inflict the carnage upon your opponent. Also, they're going to be given away a starter set. They is in Creature Caster. They is in as part of the Kickstarter campaign. All you got to do is sign up for their newsletter. There's a link in the video description below for that. Oh, yeah, and for the Kickstarter itself. So go ahead and click on that. Check out their Kickstarter. Check out Eternal Champions Judgment. And feel the power. Enjoy the game, guys. Let us know what you think of it. Leave it in the comments below. If you like this sort of thing, we will cover games like these more often. Without further ado, enjoy the battle. Hey there, Wargamers. Luca and Cullen here from MiniWargaming.com bringing you a walkthrough for Eternal Champions Judgment, a new game from Creature Caster. We're going to be playing the game right out of the walkthrough book to give ourselves and you, the viewer, a good idea of how the game plays out and some shots of the models here. Painted up by Sam Lenz. We're going to be playing straight out of the, what is this, the first play walkthrough book here. Now this comes in the the, the starter box here. There is also a, a oh, oh, rules overview booklet, but uh, we're going to be playing straight out of this. This has like the first couple turns are going to be guided at first. And then it kind of uh, opens opens the uh, the battlefield up for Luke and I to continue playing. So uh, I guess we're just going to jump into the first turn, or I guess we can go over what factions we're each playing. I'll be playing the forces of the god Krogna, and I will be controlling the forces of Ista. First things first, we set up our battlefield. Our effigies go down, Krognars and Ishtas. We have two soul pits, which will later in the game be soul, well, spawning soul tokens, which are very important for the main objective of the game. We'll get into further details of that later on. We have a pillar here, which will block line of sight and you know, obscure movement. And we have a shrine, which will play an important part of the game, generating an important resource called fate, if we can control it. And last, but certainly not least, our friendly monster pit with local dog Gloom which we'll be fighting over is an important resource as well to try and take it out, or else it will take us out. I would like to mention that in this game there are more than just the two gods here, and there are a plethora of heroes to go along with them, but for this game we have Krognar and Ishta. Now the goal of the game is to capture and convert your enemy's effigy to your own god, and you know, quell the power of theirs. Luke is trying to take my, uh, I guess, angelic shrine and turn it all spooky, evil, demon, creepy, cthulhu -y. Exactly, and by and in doing so, converting it to my cause, and we need to capture souls to do that. I'm gonna go over some of the models and their names so you can reference them, or understand what we're referencing when we play the game. This here is Skull Bonestorm. It is a two-headed ogre, very nasty. He's a defender. Over here we have a necromancer, Zarun, or sorry, Zeron. He is our soul gazer. And lastly, we have Rakir. He is an aggressor. He's an assassin orc. And for Ista, we have over there our dwarf Brock, who is our aggressor. We've got in the middle there our big minotaur cowman, Donregar. I love this guy's name. Donregar! He's a minotaur shaman, but he's a defender. And then our elf priestess, Sa Sayin, I think is how you pronounce it. And she is our soul gazer. So I think Luke and I both have one of each of the roles, positions. Exactly. We both have aggressors, defenders, and soul gazers. We start off deployed around our shrine. I've got Rakir, Zaron and Skull Bone Storm. These are predetermined deployments. Typically you're allowed to deploy around your effigy, but the walkthrough has us deploying like so. And then we have the Dwarf. We got Sayin there, we got Don Regar, and we've got Brock out on this side here. Wanted to give you an idea of what the cards look like. Now we are using the simplified versions of the characters in this walkthrough. Uh, they have more complex varieties when you're more, well, when you're used to the game and you can play to that level. 
This is for Rakir, the Orc Rogue on the left. We see some characteristics. His Soul Harvest characteristic is 2, Movement 3, Agility 4, Resilience 0. His Melee attack is 7, nothing for magic or ranged. And he has a Melee attack called a Dagger at the bottom. He strikes with his Dagger. Class 1 action point to attack with. It has a Reach of 1. It's Glance. Glancing Blow does 2 damage, Solid Blow does 3, and a Critical Blow does 5. And then he starts off at level 1. Level 2 and level 3 come later in the game when accomplishing epic deeds. He will have Viper Strike available to him at level 1, where he can poison enemies, and I'll explain how that works later on. And on the right, we simply have uh, his health at certain levels, and the health he starts off at. So he starts at 15, goes up to 16, and then up to 18. And obviously, when he reaches 0, he suffers death. There are different ways you can track the healthier. You can use dice, or you can put them in clear sleeves and use dry erase markers. Up to you. For us, we'll be using dice in this game. And of course, the other characters have different abilities built into them. They are all very unique in what their goals and uh, well, capabilities are. And there are rules associated with your effigy as well. Each god's effigy has different rules associated with it. So we are ready to begin this first battle round, and that will go to me, the Krognar player. And we start with the communion phase. Now, because it's the first battle round, we only do the generate fate step. Very simply, both players will get a fate token, which is this resource right here, and that will be for our forces to use. You can spend fate to do various things in the game, and I'll explain those when they come up. There are much more things to do in the communion phase, but you'll see that in the following battle rounds. I'm going to begin with activating Skull. This is an alternating activation game, so after I'm done activating Skull, the play will go to Cullen to activate one of his heroes. Each character is going to get three action points uh, to do various abilities on their character card, to advance around the battlefield, or to simply attack. In this case, I'm going to use two of my three action points, the first one on an advance. We're going to move up to the characteristic of three on the card. And I want to try and get to the shrine. That is my goal. So I'm going to use another advance to move two more to get to said shrine and defend it from that position. I do have one action point left, but I'm going to opt to not use it because I have nothing to attack, nor do I want to move anywhere else. And that is it for my activation. Play will pass to Cullen. So it's the first activation will be for here. We're going to go with Cyan here. And she is going to, she gets her three activation points. So she's a movement of three. So we'll spend one to move her, one, two, three, like so. And then she has a ranged ability, which is uh, a range of three. So one, two, three. So you're within my Withered Soul range, which costs one AP. So I've used uh, one AP to move, and I'll spend another two, cast my Withered Soul. And the way attacking works is, for ranged attacks, you have to draw a line of sight. In this case, there's nothing in the way, so it'll be a clear shot. And then we take her magic capability of 7 against Skull's agility of 3. And Cullen is going to get dice in the attack pool equal to the difference. Now, there are further modifiers to apply, but they're not relevant in this one case. So when they are, we will bring that up. And uh, Cullen's going to throw 4 dice. We're going to build a pool of 4 judgment dice here. I want to show you the sides on them. The blanks are misses. The twin swords are hits, and then the J, oh, this is a maneuver. And then the J symbol is, there's only one of them, it is a hit and a maneuver. Now, in this case, for this part of the walkthrough, the dice rolls are determined to show the mechanics as much as they possibly can. Now, the way this works for hitting, this is what Cullen's roll is, there's four dice. Of all of the dice rolled in the judgment attack dice pool, you're only able to take three of them. So you have to choose which results you like the best. And for this, Cullen, of course, naturally will scrap the miss because we don't care about that. We have three hits. And then for every hit you get, you look at your character card and you are going to deal damage based on the amount of hits. So one hit is a glancing blow, two hits is a solid blow, and three hits would be a critical blow. In this case, that's four damage against Skull. But Skull is a defender and he has a characteristic called resilience and you reduce the damage you take equal to your Resilience characteristic. In this case, he's got Resilience 1, so he reduces the damage down to 3. He has 21 health, he will go down to 18. So that first Withered Soul goes off using my second action point, with, which leaves me with one action point remaining, which I will just spend to cast Withered Soul again. Might as well attack again. So you get the same dice pool of four, this time Cullen rolls four hits. But again, you're only able to take three of the dice. So even though it's a better roll, it's the same result in the end. 
I uh, would end up taking four damage and my resilience would knock one off of that, making it so I take three. I'll go from 18 to 15 health on Skull Bonestorm. That will conclude Cullen's activation of Sayin, Sayin the Elf. Now it is back to Krognar, and I am going to activate Zaran, and he is going to advance for one of his actions. Now, the effigy does not block movement for your own heroes, but the enemies does. You're just not allowed to end on the tiles that the effigy is on. So we're going to advance, and we have a movement of three, so we'll go one, two, three, and then we're going to check range. The range of my attack, which is a necrotic blast, very similar to the elf's attack, just more malicious in intent, is range five. So we count the hexes, one, two, three, four, five. Unfortunately, the elf is out of range, so we're going to have to use a second action point to advance again just to get into range. And then we will attack. Now we do all of the same steps. We're going to have uh, Zarun's magic capability against Sayin's agility. She's an elf, she's got agility five, so my magic of seven is reduced down to two attack dice in the Judgment Dice Pool. She's very, very hard to hit. So, with those two dice, I roll a hit and a maneuver symbol. So this will give us an opportunity to show what the maneuver does. I uh, resolve the hit first, and because it's only one hit, it's a glancing hit with the Necrotic Blast, which does do two damage. Now, she isn't a defender. She does not have the resilience characteristic on her, so she simply takes two. And being an elf, she's not known for her fortitude. No, she is uh, just going to drop to 13. She only has 15, or no, sorry, she because she's only level one, she's base 13. And she goes down to 11 health. Oof. So she's quite easy to take out if given the opportunity. Now we resolve the maneuver die. The maneuver die allows you to push an enemy hero if you rolled it with a melee attack, or you could move yourself around. In this case, this is a magical range attack. I'm only able to move myself around. So I'm gonna use that opportunity to be a little more defensive and move back a hex. Uh, and if anyone's curious, the soul pit is just there to mark where the soul show up. They don't block line of sight or anything like that. So it was a clear shot with his necrotic blast. And that is it. That's all three of my activations for Zarun done. And we're moving to the Ishta activation. So now we're going to go on to my turn two, where I want to activate Brock, our uh, little little dwarf over here. A resident dwarf. And he's going to do, or he's going to be a good example to show you guys how to do the charge action. So I have to spend an AP to charge. So the charge AP is whatever your attack AP is plus one for the charge. So his great axe is a AP of one. So it makes the total for the attack with the charge two of your my three. But what it does do is it gives me plus two move and plus two attack dice. So it really uh, makes his uh, swings quite beefy. And he has a move two, so normally I'd only be able to move here, <laughs> but because it gives me plus two to my move, it can actually get me all the way up to Gloom. We're going to be attacking Gloom, and for a charge, you have to move in a straight line. You're allowed to do one sidestep before, which we'll show later on. That's There are restrictions to charge. Sometimes it's hard to pull off. In this case, it's lined up very, well, very easily. So my base attack is seven with Brock, but Gloom is agility four. So that drops four dice from the pool, making I would only roll three dice. But because I did make that charge, two more dice go in. Exactly. So I get to roll a total of five dice. And f with my roll, I get three misses and two hits. I still have to choose three of them. So it's I like just a miss, yeah. <laughs> two hits there. And when we look again at his great axe, it has a solid hit damage of three. So, and... Another thing about Brock is, now normally I would just do three damage, but at level one, Brock has the innate ability of Monster Slayer, which gives him plus one damage for great axes versus monsters. So and then, four. yeah, when we look at Gloom's card there, he has the monster tag. He's a monster with only eight health, so he's brought down to four, and that was two of Brock's action points. He still has one left. Right? which I will then use the last AP to just spend on another attack. Now, I don't get the additional two dice from the charge this time, so I only roll three dice uh, because his agility is four, because he's a fast little dog. But with my result, I roll two hits and one miss again. So that just becomes another three damage from the solid hit, plus one for him being a monster, which just outright kills the doggo! Now, a couple of things happen upon killing a monster. You gain its bounty, which is one fate, so the Ishta side will be at two fate, currently. 
And because Brock killed a monster, he levels up to level 2, gaining the Savagery skill. Uh, killing a monster is one of the qualifications for leveling up. There are a few others, which we'll note later when they come up. I'll give you an idea of what that looks like. At level 2, he's got Savagery, which is an action point you can spend to gain plus 1 melee characteristic and plus 1 resilience, making him a little bit more durable as an aggressor. And his health is going to go up too, so his base health is now 18. He goes from 16 to 18, which means he'd go, well, he would heal that health as well. So his max health is now 18. And in the game of Eternal Champions Judgment, there are a lot of general actions that both players have access to. One of them is called the Buy Artifact Action, which the walkthrough instructs us to use now. Now, because he killed a monster, he's able to do it at a cost of zero action points, because he has no more action points to spend, which will allow him to buy one of the artifacts that both players have access to at the cost of one fate. So Cullen will be using one of the two fate, and he's going to buy the Vorpal Blade. Yeah, there are these little uh, cards here, and they tell you right there, and it's an offensive with a cost of one fate. So I will spend one of my two fate and uh, buy and equip a Vorpal Blade to uh, Brock. Making his Great Axe a Vorpal Great Axe, and giving it well one more melee. So you have melee eight, eight. base. Brock is a brave dwarf, yet foolish. It is my turn to activate, and I am going to go with Rakir, the Orcish Assassin. Now, my movement is three. I'm also going to declare a charge. My dagger attack is one action point, so with the move and the one action point to attack, it is two action points for a charge. Again, giving me plus two movement, as well as plus two attack dice. So we'll go movement five. One, two, three, four, five. Right on top of the monster pit, which doesn't do anything for now. And we are going to attack with the dagger. And because we charge, we're going to get an extra two attack dice, or judgment attack dice, in the pool after subtracting from the agility. Give you another example of how the attack pool will work. I have a melee of seven, but Brock's agility is three. So we're going to take three dice away from that pool. But we charge, so we're going to get two extra dice in that pool to go ahead and roll. Now we get an exceptional roll. We get the two J's, the two misses, sorry, two hits, a miss, and a maneuver. Now again, I can only take three dice from this pool, but the dice on the left represent hits and maneuvers. So by taking those, I get the double effect, and I'll take one hit as well. So in the end, I get three hits and two maneuver options. Now three hits are a critical hit, which is five damage from Rakir against Brock the Dwarf. And Rakir's level one combat maneuver ability it being a combat maneuver, instead of actually taking the push actions, I can give up both of them. It does require two of them, as you can see in the parentheses beside Viper Strike to use. I poison the enemy with my blade. Put the little poison token beside Brock, or you can put it on his card, whatever you prefer. And this will reduce his stats significantly. His movement agility is both reduced by one as well as his melee. Pretty much all characteristics reduced by one for the most physical characteristics. And that poison will last on him until the end of his next activation. Oof. And since he's already activated this battle round, he's going to be suffering that for quite a while. Now, I only spent two of my action points for the charge and attack. We're going to spend our last one on simply attacking again to try and do as much damage to Brock as we can. Now, something interesting to point out is I have seven dice here for my melee attack. Brock's agility, because he's poisoned, is reduced down to two. So I actually get five dice in my pool to go ahead and roll. We end up getting three hits, a maneuver, and a miss. I'm not too concerned about the maneuver, so we're going to take the three hits here and apply another critical on Brock, which is a further five damage, bringing him down to eight. All right, on to my next activation, or my last activation, because I only have Don Regar left to activate, um, our Minotaur Shaman there. Now, I kind of have two options, whether I want to go right or left. Do I want to protect the shrine, or at least battle for the shrine that Luca just captured with this half-ogre there? Or do I want to try to protect my dwarf who appears to be getting punched? But the shrine is what generates fate at the end of the turn. Um, so we want to try to claim that from Luca. So we're going to start spending our three action points, and we're going to spend our first action point to move up. One, two, three. And now I want to charge him for my remaining two. But this is the awkward kind of moment where you can only charge in a straight line or a slalom. So like a uh, 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 kind of straight line. Um, but I can't do that to get to him. So the fortunate part of the charge action is it allows you to do a sidestep action, which does count as part of your movement. 
but it means you can kind of step to this one hex around you before you make the charge. So yeah. I'm going to move to here. And then, so that's one of my movement, but because I do get plus two movement for the charge, I have a total of five hexes I can move here. So we're going to do one to sidestep, and then two, three, four to complete the charge. Now the slalom would have worked also in this case. Uh, I could have made it with a zigzag, had enough movement, but they wanted to show off the sidestep. You move to one adjacent hex first, then move in a straight line. And now we get to resolve our attack as part of our charge action. So base, Dorogar has a melee of six. You have an agility of three. three. And then I did charge, so I get an additional two dice. So this is what I rolled. We got a, uh, this is the J, the, the hit maneuver, two hits and a maneuver and a miss. So we can only take three of these and the maneuver could allow me to push or follow up or move around. Um, so what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna drop one of the hits, which might seem a little strange because it will mean we're doing less damage because now we're having two hits and two maneuvers here. Right. But what, so the two hits is a solid hit, which will be three damage to your, uh... My resilience of Skull. One. Skull, yeah. So in the end, it'll be two damage, bringing him down to 13, because I have the one resilience. And then I do have the two maneuver points, so I'll use the first one to push you back, and then I will follow up. Right. So what it does is it pushes you away from the shrine, and leaving me in base contact with the shrine. It also doesn't push you out of my melee distance, which could give you an attack on me. Right, so now these two titans are permanently engaged, there's no charging either one of them to do, and control of the shrine is in Cullen's hands. A great move. And with all of the heroes activated, the first battle round is complete. We now move on to the second battle round, starting with the communion phase proper, where we will hit all of the steps. The first step is to resolve any abilities that the heroes or other models may have in the communion phase. In this regard, Doen Regar has the regeneration ability, which, ki uh, which kicks off here, and he would heal wounds, but he's already at full health, so yeah. in the end it doesn't do anything for now, but it's important to note. The next step in the communion phase is to move any unbound souls that may have been spawned on the soul pits, that which has not happened yet, so we don't have to do that. We also have to move monsters if poor Gloom was still around. Uh, you would roll a d2, so it's a four up, or a one to three on a d6, and the monster moves that many hexes, uh, on a, a two hexes or one hex, and they would attack the nearest hero nearby. In this case, Gloom is dead, so that will not be happening. <laughs> Step three is both players generate a free fate. This only happens in the first two battle rounds of the game. So that is our last free fate from the game in the communion phase. We have to earn the rest of our fate from here on out. Step four is to spawn souls and monsters. Now you have to randomize which soul pit they will spawn at. And in this case, it'll be spawning in this one. And then from here on out, they will be alternating which soul pit will spawn a soul. Now the souls are very important. They become the immediate objective both players are going to be going for because the souls are the main way to damage and eventually take control of the enemy's effigy. Also, in this step, monsters would respawn as long as they didn't die in the previous battle round. Now in this case, Gloom did die. He will be joining us in the third battle round. And also, in Eternal Champion's judgment, they are eternal champions, and they respawn when they die. In this case, no champions or heroes have died, so they will not be respawning. And that's it for the communion phase. We're ready to start activating yet again in the second battle round. And to determine who goes first in the new battle round, you simply look at who went last in the previous one. So I, I moved Dorigar last, so that would mean I went last, which means Luca goes first at the beginning of round two. Alrighty. The first thing I want to do is activate Zeron, my necromancer, and the soul is available and I want to try and capture it. The way you capture souls is best with the soul gazers. They have, an, they have a good soul harvest characteristic and they are the best at trying to capture a soul. Now, you have to be adjacent to a soul to capture it unless you're a soul gazer. Then you have to be in range 2. Unfortunately for Zeron, he is three hexes away. Now we're going to try something a little ambitious here. To capture a soul, it normally costs two action points. So what we're going to try and do, we're going to get greedy. Naturally, the Necromancer way. We are in range to attack Brock with the Necromantic Blast, and we're going to hope to roll a maneuver, thus able to push or maneuver our hero one hex closer after dealing damage to Brock, and then allow us to spend two of our action points to attempt to capture that soul. 
I have a magic characteristic of seven, and Brock's agility is still crippled because of the poison, so yep. he only avoids two of the dice. But there's a further modifier now. I am attacking an enemy who is adjacent to one of my allies, therefore I suffer a negative one because it's a ranged attack. It's the opposite if it's a melee attack. You actually get plus one because you're being assisted by an ally. So I only get four dice. Now unfortunately, I roll three hits and a miss. Not what I wanted, because I wanted a maneuver. A great roll, it's a critical hit, but I don't get to move to the soul, therefore my greed does not quite pay out there. So a critical hit from the Necromantic Blast is four damage. Putting him down four. Well, seeing as I can't harvest that soul because it's two action points and I won't be able to get near it and harvest it, I'm simply going to try and kill Brock. So I'll get the same amount of dice. Be rolling the four dice here. But it's horrible luck and I am cursed with four misses. And Zeron's frustration is evident. I do zero damage with my second activation. Though Zeron has one trick up his sleeve, he has an ability at level one called the From Below. It's one fate to use this, and it's my last action point. I will summon a model of the type Minor Undead, Necromancer Familiar. It's a little skeleton. And uh, I have to pay the cost on the summoned uh, creature's card, which is the one fate. Or it's one action point plus one fate. You can see the right, uh, summon cost right there. Of the two fate I have stored, I have one now. We'll summon that familiar adjacent to Zeron, and the way they work is they have their own action points, their own capabilities, though instead of having three, they only have two. And they activate, um, you can activate them immediately upon summoning or at the end of your hero's turn. They just activate when the hero who summoned them activates. In this case, I still get to activate the summon because Zeron's activation isn't over until his summons are activated. So we, with two action points, we're simply going to declare a charge against Doan Ragar, the giant minotaur here. Uh, my attack only costs one action point, the move only costs one action point, so we're just gonna move in a straight line there and charge Doan Ragar and resolve some attacks. Now, I've only got a melee of two, and Doan Ragar's agility is three, so I would reduce this pool by three, but you can never reduce the Judgment Die attack pool by uh, below one. And I charge, so I get to add two more dice to that. And I'm being assisted by Skull, an ally. So I'll get a further die on top of all that. And I'll be rolling four dice against uh, Doen Regar. And we roll a critical hit, because we'll take the three hits. Now I'm attacking with Brittle Bones. I don't have a weapon, I just have my arms I'm slapping with. So it, <laughs> it only really does three damage. And Doen Regar is a defender with resilience one. So in the end, I only do two damage to the Mighty Minotaur. But hey, it's something. He goes down to uh, 17. 18 math is hard. On to Ista activation. We are going to start by activating Cy Yin again. Now it's important to know that she actually has an innate ability that is called Aura of Light, that she gets to heal friendly models within two hexes of her, one health point, um, and they gain an additional plus one for each level she has earned. She's only level one now, but her healing does apply to herself. So she, she took a few damage, a little bit of damage earlier from Zeron. So she will heal one herself. Nice. And then we're gonna go on to actually spending her action points. Uh, we don't wanna leave that soul sitting there for too long. So she's gonna make a beeline for the soul. She's gonna go uh, use her first to move. Yeah, do it. And one, advance. two. Uh, not gonna use all of her three, just gonna use the two to get us here. And then we're going to spend our last two AP on the Soul Harvest action. Yeah, it is important because she is a Soul Gazer, which means she could harvest from a tile away, because it does give her a range of two to harvest. But uh, this also gives me an additional model on that shrine there, uh, just in case something happens to Don Regar and uh, you know that uh, troll is able to walk up and reclaim it from me. So this kind of, I guess, doubles down on that shrine there for me. So, to do the soul harvest action, we have to look at our card of the character doing the soul harvesting, and they have a soul harvest value. Now she's a soul gazer, which means she is better than normal. My other guys on my team only have a soul harvest of three, but she has a soul harvest of six. So, what you gotta do is you gotta take that number, which is six in this case, and try to add it to 2d6, which you roll, and then you want to equal or surpass 12? Yes, so we're looking for a six on the 2d6 here. 
So, and for the sake of showing it off, the walkthrough has a succeed here on the six. Yep, we just just got the six plus our six, which is a total of twelve. Good enough. So she harvests this soul, which now stays on her character, because if she ever dies, she will drop the soul where she died. So, uh, I guess she, I, though I do gain the soul and remove health from Luca's shrine by doing so, uh, he can still regain the health if he picks the soul back up. That's correct. So now uh, two things happen. One, she levels up because she's successfully soul oh, harvested. Oh yes, that is correct. She's level two. And like Cullen mentioned, harvesting the soul does do damage to the shrine, though it is not permanent. To make it permanent, she will have to make it back to her shrine, the effigy of Ista back here, and then bank it by spending an action and making the damage to my shrine permanent. Now the damage it deals is four, and each shrine has 20 health. So you have to bank five souls or actually attack the shrines themselves to deal damage to them. And you can see how you get to your objective now by harvesting the souls. Now for the sake of the tutorial, we will have our effigy start at 16 health. So it does bring it down to 12, but I have a chance of recovering that health by taking out the filthy elf. Would also like to note that Seiyin the elf gains one more permanent health for being level two and access to a new ability called Holy Shield, which costs one act, uh, action point to use, which we'll explain when it comes up. Now for Krognar's activation. If Cullen is going to deny me a soul, I will simply take one for myself. There are other ways to gain souls other than the ones that spawn, and that is simply by killing heroes and harvesting the souls they have inside of them. So I will activate Rakir, my orcish rogue, and he's going to attack Brock mm -hmm. and try to finish him off. He's still poisoned. He is still poisoned, so after everything is said and done, I'm going to be getting five judgment attack dice. I'm going to be rolling these dice up. But fate is cruel for Krugnar. We get five misses. Zero damage. And Brock only has four health left, I believe, or something. Yeah, I'm four health left. So, at least we get to show you another mechanic, though at a cost. There's an ability both players have access to called Try Again. And it is a reroll on any dice roll in the game at the cost of one fate. And you cannot reroll a reroll. So you cannot keep spending fate to get a reroll. But this will allow me to roll that horrible roll into something ideally more successful. Also should note you have to roll the whole pool again. You can't simply pick and choose what you want to re-roll. So if you got like a couple of like J's in there and you want, I really need a third one, you can't do that. All or nothing. And we get a much better roll this time. So we have to pick three of these dice. We're obviously going to take the two hits and the hit and maneuver with the J, which means I get a critical hit and a maneuver afterwards. Uh, my critical hits on Rakir are five damage, which is enough Ooh. to slay Brock and collect his soul. Now, because I was able to slay him I in, in combat, I automatically harvest his soul. I still have two action points left. Now, something unique to Krognar and their effigy, and Ishta has their own as well, which I'll explain afterwards, is there is an action that both players have access to, and that is recall to effigy for two action points. Now, Krognar costs one. That's what we're going to do. We're going to recall to the effigy. So instead of moving or advancing, we are going to take our hero and place them anywhere adjacent to the effigy. We're going to choose this spot right here. So you like Nightcrawler, bam! He's just like over here. And then banking the souls into the effigy cause permanent damage to the opponent's effigy. So currently dealing four damage to oh, the no. effigy of Ishta. We're going to spend the last action point available to Rakir to bank that into our effigy and start good progress to the end of the game. Ow. And I would love to note that killing a hero is another clause for leveling up. So you have soul harvesting, killing the monster, and killing the hero. Rakir is now level two. He has access to toxin, which is one fate, and you target adjacent enemy that is suffering poison to take 2d6 true damage. And you can imagine what that is. I also gain more health. Well, it goes back to my activation, and since you killed my dwarf, I only have one other guy to choose, so it's Don Rigar who's going to activate, and uh, he's got a couple options there on who to attack into. Um, but we pretty much, the issue is, is because Luca, both of his guys have another guy adjacent to them, he's going to be getting plus one to his agility right? Um, for any of the attacks I try to make. So I'm going to try to clear off the skeleton first, um, because he's got the lower agility than the other guy who would be even harder to hit. So let's try to go for him. And Don Regar attacks with five dice normally. Or six dice normally, sorry. 
And then you are agility two on your skeleton? Yep. And then minus one. Because I have another hero nearby. Exactly. Support. So it's only three dice. And with those three dice, I roll three crit, or three hits, which is a crit. Crits for days. Five damage to your skeleton. Well, let me tell you, this skeleton only has four. <laughs> Get out of my house. Killing a summon doesn't relinquish a soul, but it does clear out the battlefield a little bit. All right, with that skeleton out of the way, we're going to spend our second action point to swing at scroll? Skull! Skull! And uh, so we're going to attack him. We got six dice, but he's got an agility of three. So we're still back down to three dice for our pool, which gives me two hits. And that counts as a solid hit, which deals three damage to him. Which by resilience of one will knock down to two, bringing me to 11 health on Skull. But Doan Regar still has one action point left. Now we're at the point of the walkthrough where we start and roll in our own dice, and fate is going to take over the game. Yeah, so I got one action point left, which I will spend to attack again. Uh, so again, my three dice. And uh, we'll see what I get. Okay, so, it was the exact same result. <laughs> so another three damage from my great staff. Reduced down to two. Nine health left on Skull Bone Storm. Well, this leaves my last activation. That's Skull Bone Storm. Though, I'm up toe-to-toe -to -toe with Doan Regar, a legendary warrior who has regeneration and resilience. Hard enough to take out. And why fight him when there is a pathetic elf right behind him? So what we're going to do is we have a few extra action points this turn. Well, we have three. I'm not going to need the third one. So I'm going to spend an action point to use Skull Bone Storm's ability. It's his level one ability called Bulwark. It's an action point. I target a friendly non-defender model within two hexes, and they gain five temporary health, which will expire at the start of Skull's next activation. So we're going to do that now and put that on Zeron. So he will have five extra free health, until Skull activates next. And I could activate Skull as my final activation next round, so that temporary health will help out Zeron quite a bit. I think we shall see. I have two action points left, and what we're gonna do is declare a charge against the elf, Sayin. Now, the way this works is I'm currently engaged with Doan Regar, so I cannot declare a charge against him, but I can declare a charge against another non-engaged enemy. So we're gonna move here for the charge. So that's a one side step, and then we're gonna move two hexes straight, and because we move out of unengagement range, or we unengage with Doan Regar, he's allowed to use a rule called parting blows, which means he's allowed to have a free attack action against me, which could deal damage, and the only difference is he's not allowed to use any maneuver dice, only apply damage. So that's what Cullen will be fishing for. So Cullen's gonna go ahead and roll up that parting blow, and he gets three dice after all the modifiers, and he gets one hit and a maneuver and a miss, and again, cannot use the maneuver. So it is just a glancing blow. So two damage, which gets subtracted to one. So I take another damage, bring me down to eight. But a small price to pay to crush Elf. Now attacking Saiyan, I have melee five. Uh, and she's got agility five, let's not forget. But the die pool can never be reduced below one. And we did charge. So we actually have three dice against her. We get an outstanding roll of two, two J's, which is a hit and a maneuver, and a hit. So that's a critical hit and two maneuvers afterwards. So we're going to apply the critical hit from Skull Bone Storm, which is four damage from his brutish axe, bringing the weak little elf down to nine HP. We're getting there. Uh, and I also have two maneuvers. So what I'm going to do with that is we're going to push her there, and we're going to take her position. That way we're beside the shrine, as well as Doan Regard and re-engaging the Minotaur so he cannot charge my guy later on. And if he chooses to fight him, well, he's just stuck fighting them. Sorry, she's, at actually, she's actually at eight health, not nine. I didn't look at the right card. <laughs> Sorry about that. And that is the end of the second battle round. You know, I forgot to mention for the last communion phase, we're gonna mention it in this one, but it is the bonus for controlling the shrine. Whoever controls it gets D3 fates. Forgot to show that earlier. Cullen's forces controlled it last turn, and he would have he gained two extra fates. So he's currently at four before we move into this communion phase. Okay, so at the top of the communion phase, uh, any of the at the start of the communion phase abilities go off. So uh, Don Regar here has uh, at the start of the communion phase heal too. 
So he's actually only taken two damage. So he'll go back up to his total of 20 for level one. Filthy regeneration. The next step is moving souls and monsters. There are currently none on the battlefield, so we skip that one. And go to, th and go to step three, which is generate fate. Uh, we, there's no free fate because we're past turn two, but we do generate one fate. Per bound soul? Per bound soul we have. And we uh, she controls a soul, and your shrine controls a soul, so we each gain one fate for this turn. So that puts your total up to... I should only have one right one, now. One, yep. and then puts my total up to five. And then we check to see who controls a shrine. Neither one of us controls a shrine, so neither one of us gets D3 extra fate as we fight over this. The next step is spawning souls and monsters. So we know that the soul is going to spawn over here. And Gloom is back into the game. Cause Hello! Died in the first battle round, back in the third. The final thing is resurrecting heroes. Now we all know Brock got taken out last turn. And the way resurrecting works is he keeps all of his upgrades and levels, and he is placed adjacent to his effigy. There's usually a bonus to coming back to life. Uh, you do not come back with full health, but the Ishta effigy special rule is all of their heroes always resurrect with full health. Right, they normally resurrect with minus five health from their maximum. All right, so Brock will be showing up with 18 health anywhere around that effigy. And we're ready to start activating for the third battle round. And we've shown off most of the mechanics of the game, and we are ready to start scrapping and finish off each other's effigy, both at 12 health. Yeah. All right, so I think I... Now, okay, no, no books to help us here. So this is straight <laughs> up Cullen tactics. And uh, really, we want to make sure the soul that she's carrying is safe. Um, so it's a little awkward because she could get back here, but then she'll get booped if she tries to go away. So... After a little thought, uh, she could try to use the recall, pop back here, and then you know put the soul in the e in the effigy here. But um, I think we're going to take the opportunity without any skeletons and just use Don Regard to try to kill off the Skull there, who's going to be causing me some issues. All right, so we're going to declare attack against uh, Skull to Bone Storm here. He's only got eight health left, so Don Regard is going to get four attack dice because of the adjacent ally. We're going to turn to face. Yeah, heck yeah, because uh, we're, we're narrative here. And yeah, he gets the additional for her being there, because it's engaged with him, not in contact with him. Right. And let's see what you get. Uh, Four dice in the end. Uh, and natural rolls. We get a maneuver and a hit. Huh. I don't know. I got a lot of fate. There's five that, fate here. That only does two damage, which will be reduced to one. So, like, yeah, let's, let's use one of these fates for a reroll. Let's see what Try we Try again. Wah. Hey, critical hit. Much better. And what's the critical hit on Doan Regar? Five Rigar? damage. So down to four. I have four health left, and Doan Regar still has four or two action points left. Which he will use another one to right. attack again. All right, so it's four dice again. Okay, that's two. That's a, a good hit and uh, two maneuvers. Yeah, which oh puts him down to one, which is really that's annoying. But I think we're going to do it. So we're going to deal, is that just full, a four damage then for a solid blow? It's a three. Oh, three damage. So it's reduced down. It brings him down to two oh, health. Oh, it brings him down to two. Yeah. So I'm going to push you, because I have two maneuvers as well. Push and follow up. Nice. To here. And then you have one action point left. Which we'll just use to, I think, try to finish you off here, because right. I don't see anything else to do with it, really. Still four dice in the attack pool. And that there is enough. That should be three damage. That's only two. So I do <gasps> have to spend a fate. Try again. Interesting. I wonder if Skull Bonestorm will survive. Man, if I spend two fate and he still lives? No! Oh, but you do have two maneuvers. So that's only two damage. Huh. Yeah. So I scrapped that. Cullen does not need to reroll that because Doan Regard does three damage on a solid blow, which yeah. was reduced down to two, which is all I have. So he is destroyed. You harvest a soul, dealing four damage to my effigy. Two of your heroes are currently carrying them. And you also level up. Woohoo! After that, my shrine is reduced down to eight health. Well, I'm, I'm in a pickle here, because I could have Zeron here. He's not, doesn't have line of sight to Syene, the elf, whom I would love to go for here before she activates, because my line of sight would draw, would go through Doan Regar's Hex, which means he's blocking line of sight. I could activate and simply move in the direction of the soul 
and then attack her twice. Or I could try to get greedy again, like the uh, the walkthrough had me do earlier. Right. Attack Doe and Regar, and hopefully get a maneuver, so that I could just maneuver once and then attack her twice. That's I like the idea of the greedy play. I get a little bit more damage spread out. So I'm gonna go ahead and do just that. We're gonna go ahead and declare a necrotic blast against Doe and Regar. We get four attack dice uh, because agility three to magic seven. She does not lower by one because it has to be one of mine engaged with the enemy there. Well, I get the maneuver, <laughs> but I don't do damage. And he regenerates two. I'm not really going to fish for a reroll here because I'd have to do a good amount of damage and get the maneuver. So with this, I'm going to maneuver twice, I suppose, and get attacked by the monster. But I got Bulwark. I wonder if I lose Bulwark because my guy died. And then from there, I'll spend two more actions to attack. Well, I, I predict I will. For now, I will simply do one more basic attack against her now that I can draw a line from uh, my hex to her hex without going over doing regards. And that is going to be my seven dice minus her five agility. So I'm only throwing two attack dice at her. Not super efficient. Oh. Ah, oh, I need to kill her before she activates, and she's got eight health left. Oof. Right, what's the max damage you could do? Yeah, what is the max damage I could do, actually? With the product Oh, I can't, I can't even kill her, eh? Well, okay, well then I will maneuver. Mm. Let's maneuver one backwards and throw another Necrotic Blast, and uh, see what that gets me. Oh, jeez, this guy's the maneuver god! Zoom! <laughs> what's he doing? He just, he just, okay. He's blasting and casting, but not actually hitting anything. <laughs> just, it's just all a firework oh, show. Yeah. That's all it is. All right, cover well, fire, cover fire. He's done. <laughs> all right, now we're going to come back to my activation where I'm going to activate Sai Yin here with her soul token she has. Um, we want to go put it in the shrine. Now, we could spend two AP to teleport to the effigy, but we're within walking distance. Yep. So let's just spend the one. And one, two, three. We're just going to get right over to it. And then we're going to bank the soul. We're going to put her soul into the shrine. Wah, wah, wah. This keeping the damage permanent on my effigy there. Also, when she activates, she heals herself and Doan Regar. For oh, correct. Yeah, she would have. Doan Regar is not injured. Oh, he's fine then. Yeah. And she is injured. So she will gain two because she has leveled up. Nice. And we have an option to use her new ability that she got at level two Holy Shield on her dwarf friend. But while we're next to the shrine, I think we're going to use this opportunity to spend one of our four fate we have banked up and buy the Ring of Power. Giving her plus one permanent magic. Yeah, it puts her magic to eight instead of seven. That will complete her activation. And we still have Brock who could go. He's a little slow, but there's a monster right in front of him. I should finish that thought. That makes me wonder what to do with Rakir. Hmm. He's not in a position to really alpha strike anyone. I guess he could try to get the soul, but his soul harvest very bad. <laughs> very, very bad. I think the only real option I have with him is to declare a charge. So we'll do a sidestep and then move. Boom. And then that's two of my action points to, uh, because of the attack action cost one. And we're going to attack uh, the poor Gloom <laughs> who just respawned. I will have five judgment dice after all the modifiers. And I can't. Wow! Wow! Uh, that is. I have to do more damage than that, so I'm going to use my fate to try again. Okay, that's your last fate. Ooh, we get a critical. That's five damage. And one, I'm not going to bother with the maneuver. That does bring Gloom down to three health, and we are going to use our last action to simply attack. And because this is a regular attack, no charge bonus, I only get the three dice. Oh, but we get a crit. Boom! That does take out Gloom. That does level up Rakir. He's actually level three now, because he killed Skull. Not, not Skull, he killed uh, Brock. Brock, and then he just killed the monster. And I get some stuff. So I get the bounty of one fate, and I can immediately buy an artifact for uh, zero action points. And I too, like Brock, will buy the Vorpal Blade. I've, I'm still back to zero fate. I was also using that so Brock couldn't charge the dog and kill it, but he can still move and charge. And Brock is the last activation of this battle round. I have a bit of an interesting decision here. Um, I could try to just go for the soul token. Uh, the problem is, is Brock only moves two. <laughs> He's slow. So it would be like two. And then two, two. And then not harvest. And then the harvest costs two, so it, he'll just be standing in front of it. Um, and kind of anywhere just standing here, I feel like, is really bad spot for getting uh, both Lucas guys to attack me. So I think we're going to... It does leave me in a bit of a weak spot to be attacked by the new guy who comes in. But we're going to... One, two for one action. 
And then charge. And then charge for up to a f up to four, which we can go three. And then we get plus two judgment dice. After everything is said and done, six dice from Brock into a Rakir, who's agility four. And what do you get? You get, okay. Two maneuvers and, and a, a hit. glancing hit if you want to keep that. Uh, uh, so it's at the end of the turn. So we might as well spend a fate because I control this shrine, so I'm going to be getting more, and I might as well spend the resources I have. Yeah, so that's two fate left, re-rolling, trying again, and getting a slightly better result. So one maneuver and two hits, which is a standard hit there. It's a solid hit. How much damage does he do on a solid hit? He does a total of three. All right, well, I am now at 18 health at level three. I'm down to 15. And because Brock moved first, that is his last action point. Did you, and you did not want to use the maneuver? No pushing, no pulling? You, you're not moving around anywhere? No... I like the idea of having the sorcerer in front of me as kind of protection. Um, it's not in a way that you can just double with just, he'll have to at least spend two to walk around or something. So I think it makes more sense for me to not move. Okay. And just stand where I'm at for now. For the next communion phase, don't regard what heal, but he's already at full. Now we're gonna move unbound souls and monsters. No monsters, but we got that soul to We move. actually have a soul to move. Sorry, it was actually the souls that move D2 hexes. The monsters have a move characteristic. I mentioned that earlier, so scrap that. We're actually gonna move the soul here. It moves D2 hexes towards the nearest hero. So they're both equally distant away and it would just move there between the two of them. And then we're gonna move on to step three, which is generate fate. Uh, so we each get one for each soul we have, which I have two currently. Yeah, so you're up to four fate and I'm up to one fate. You're gonna get an additional D3 fate because you control the shrine though. And yep, so I will roll my D3. Ooh, two okay. more, you got six fate! Woo! Six. Step four, spawn monsters and souls. So we know the monster is not respawning because it just died, but we will have a soul spawning Boop. at that point. One quick correction on the previous round, we just realized now that when you respawn a hero, they actually respawn with one fewer action points. So poor Brock here would have only had two action points. Yeah, he wouldn't have able to actually make that charge. So instead of doing, because I moved and then I charged, <laughs> for three action points. Instead, before he moves, I will spend one of the fate I had, because at the end of the turn I had two. Yep. And I will buy the boots of agility for him. Which giving... increases his agility by one. Exactly. And now, he does already have a artifact, but it's an offensive artifact, so you can have one offensive and one defensive. Right. So he's got those two now, and then he'll move up two. And then that just means I don't take the damage I took on Ruck here. Yep. Oh, he's just fine. And that's all that has to change there. We're going to continue. Oh, I would get a fate back because I spent a fate to reroll the... Correct, yeah. And then, on to resurrecting heroes, I am going to resurrect... Scroll. It's your boy! But he comes back. This round, he's only going to have two action points and 16 health instead of his normal 21. And that will bring it to the next battle round where I get to activate first. I think it's imperative I take a nab at that soul and try and grab it before anything too nefarious happens. Who is going to do it, is the uh, question. We are going to do it with our soul gazer, Zoran, is going to do it. And we get plus one of the roll because we are near an allied hero. And he has a soul harvest of six in that regard. So I need to show a, uh, sorry, seven. I need to show a five or more on the dice. Look for five. Whomp, no! Whomp, whomp. But I will use my try again on that. You can do it okay. on any roll. Oh, we got it just. So that's four damage to Cullen's effigy, uh, you know, and then I still have one more action point left on him. It's two to harvest the soul. That does level him up to level two, where you will have a vampiric touch. Target friendly model within three hexes gains leech two. Ooh. You know what? Maybe I'll do that. That sounds kind of cool. But then again, I could just move to the effigy and bank it next turn. Nah, we're going to do vampiric touch on Rakir for one action point. These are necromantic abilities here and put vampiric touch which will expire at the end of his next activation. So if he does take any damage, then he'll be able to heal it up. But if he does, and by the time he activates, then it's kind of worthless. Leech two, everyone, leech two. So then Sayin will go, and she will use her first AP to move. So she'll go one, two. Advancing to within two hexes of the soul to harvest, perhaps? Uh, she also heals herself only. Yeah, yeah, she's Nothing. gonna heal to two. She'll heal two, go up to 12. 12 of her 14, so we're getting there. And then she'll stay a tile away, but try to harvest the soul. And she will get plus one because Doan Rigar is nearby. D2 needs to show a five. Yep. 
And you got it. That's a level up for level three on her. And I am down to four. Boom. Oh, I got a soul. On my effigy, it's starting to crumble. And that's all three of her action points. But she does level up. That's true. Putting her. We're going to act Skull Bonestrum. Bonestrum. Bonestorm. Uh, he's only got two action points. He's going to declare a charge. He's going to sidestep and then move the rest. So that's four. Oh. Four of his five move. We're just going to go and get right in front of Bork. Brock. Bork. B Bork. <laughs> We're going to attack and we'll get a couple bonus dice, but his agility is up by one right now because he's got boots of agility, so he should be at agility four. Yep. Got three dice in the end and I get a hit. Ooh, I got two hits in a maneuver. I'll keep that. So it's solid blow, which is three damage and a maneuver. I don't think I really want to use that maneuver. I'm going to use it on... Uh, yeah. Hmm. I guess we'll put it over. Here. We'll push you over here. Urgh. Nah, I don't like that. We're just gonna keep you there. Sorry. And yeah, that's it. Just some damage. And put some down to 15 health. So starting off on our next activation, I think we're gonna go with Brock here and try to kill the guy who just kind of walked up to him. No. I mean, if you kill him, you win. Because I only have four health on my effigy left. He does have resilience, and I kind of messed up moving in there because he blocked a path I wanted to take with Rakir now that I think about it. So let's see what you got. Just getting five dice. I'm agility three against melee hmm. eight. You know what? So I could either attack. I have a ability for him as level two that gives him plus one melee. One more. That's one less attack, though. It is, but it's also plus one resilience, which means he'll. has a little. If he gets attacked back, right? Right. He could be a lot tankier and maybe not just get one hit by your uh, creepy assassin back there. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, we're going to savage up. We might as well, use, I just want to show off the ability because we've got it. So we're going to use one of his attacks. And like, I have three attacks that have max five damage, minus one from him. So best case, I do 12. 15 yeah. to 12, which doesn't kill a 16 anyway. So... Uh, we're, we're just going to do two attacks at six dice. So instead gonna, of yeah. Savagery ability, he gains resilience one and one more melee. So he actually has nine melee reduced down to six dice for the attack. Yeah. So, uh... That's a critical hit. So that's five damage, which down. drops to four. So he's down at 12 health left, and you have one more action point left. Which we will use to attack again. Alrighty. Might as well try it again. Six dice, and... Uh, okay, another crit. Four more damage, he's at eight health left. Okay. My last activation will be Rakir, and he's going to declare a charge. And we're going to get a little bit extra dice because we're near our buddy here. So we'll see what we can do. Uh, we are going to get a couple extra dice. Your agility is four, though, correct? Yep, I did boost it with my boots. And that's, I, so I get four base dice, and then I'll get plus two for the charge. And I'll get plus one because I have an ally adjacent to you as well. And minus four for my resilience? It was minus oh, one damage. It would be minus one damage in the end there. Ooh, that's a pretty poo roll. But we'll keep it. So we're going to do a glancing hit. And instead of using the maneuvers, I'm simply going to poison Brock again. Mm. So we're going to put poison on him to reduce the stats a little bit. And you only take, I believe, uh, one damage because you have resilience on him. I mean, that's a big deal. I could have... Uh, she just gained an ability... That allows me, or her... Oh, the Holy Shield. Yeah, yeah. she could have yeah. put a shield on him, which was something I was thinking about doing because I knew that I could get poisoned, but... Eh. <laughs> it would be tempting to do his level 2 ability, which is Envenom, but he's got too much health. It's 2d6 true damage, which just goes to all defenses. But I'd have to roll. I can't possibly kill him. So I'm going to do one more attack without the charge bonus. I go down to 4 dice, but I get 5 because I'm near an ally. He's also engaged with the target. Well... It's a, it's a roll. I do one more <laughs> I do one more damage. We tried. Brock is too thick. He's down to 13 health, and that is it for his activation. And then that life uh, vampire touch goes away. All right, and then we're going to have our big boy, Don Regar here. Uh, let me just make sure. I uh, well, um, yeah. was just checking his level 2 ability. Uh, it's just affects uh, defense, and we need him to be beefy and try to kill uh, that monster that's out front there. So, we're not monster. Skull! So, we're going to charge. So, boop, boop, boop. Um, Let me get some dice. So, it's going to be your six minus my three agility, but plus three because there's an adjacent ally as well as the charge bonus. Let's roll it up. You need a couple of critical hits here in a row. We got, our, we got six dice. You should be able to At pull this off. At least for the off. first attack. And you have lots of fate as well, so if you don't get a critical. That's true. So you got a critical. That's enough to bring him down to four. 
from eight. So if you get one more critical on the next attack, you both take them out, level up, get the last soul that takes my effigy out. Wow, okay. Um, there's no real reason to move them around either. Yep, but we only get four dice from that. Is the, the next one's only four, so we need to have a pretty good roll here. Yeah, the, the, the charge helped, but again, we do have six fate. Oh, we Boom. got it. You got it, because that's, yeah, that's, that's the crit. crit. So that's a critical. He's taken out. You immediately harvest his soul, uh, which is, well, levels you up, and then puts four more damage on my effigy, which then, cr I don't know if it crumbles it so much as allows it, or weakens it enough for you to convert it to your cause. Yeah, the, the, the god's essence maybe trickles out of it, leaving it uh, a, a free free uh, shrine to be captured by the any other god, such as Istar. And I think it's safe to say it's a cleansing of the one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this way it is, it is a cleansing. If it went the other way, maybe it would have been a ruination. I would say so. I would agree with that 100%. And that is a victory for the forces of Ishta. And that, folks, is Eternal Champions Judgment. Thanks for watching. Happy Wargaming. The old gods are dead. This world's very existence is threatened by forces incomprehensible to most mortals. Yet even with this threat, the rising new gods cannot help but bicker for power and control. Risking their very souls, the heroes who align themselves to the new gods fight on an eternal battlefield where death is not allowed and victory must be won at all costs. This is Judgment, Eternal Champions. Power is the sweetest drug. The dead tell me stories of your demise. My two heads be better than all you heads. It would be easier to move the mountains than to make me stand aside. I trade in death. Money for a life. <laughs> there is nothing more precious than the good steel of a well-made axe. Judgment Eternal Champions is an action-packed and competitive tabletop miniatures game. Gameplay is fast-paced with constant interactions between you and your opponent. Start by selecting a god to represent you and deploy your warband of powerful Eternal Champions from a vast roster of varied and unique heroes, all of which bring dynamic abilities and unique powers to the battlefield. To come out victorious in Judgment Eternal Champions, you have one ultimate goal. Overwhelm your opponent's effigy first and you win the battle. While deceptively simple in premise, there are multiple methods to achieve victory and incredible strategic depth which makes for compelling and unique battles each and every time. Collect, paint and play beautifully detailed heroes full of individuality and character. I am unmovable. I am unshakable. I make the dead walk. I barter with the gods. I know power. Wage conflict on multiple battlefield layouts using immersive terrain features that can play significant roles in what happens in the game and how you achieve victory. I have you now. My shadow will be the last thing you see. It's not just your opponent you'll have to deal with though, monsters spawn on the battlefield as well. And if you're not careful... No! We stop me food! To reward you for your feats in battle, your heroes will gain levels that unlock more unique abilities and increase their influence in the game. Fate points can be acquired to help you gain in-game advantages or to collect magical artifacts to bolster your heroes. In Judgment Eternal Champions, every hero can turn the tide of battle. I've made your strengths my own. When your hero kills an enemy, they collect their soul and in doing so, cause damage to your opponent's effigy. Now I add another soul to my collection. Heroes can attack an effigy directly as well. We end this one for the client to attend to. Do enough damage and you win the game. Let us end this conflict. Judgment Eternal Champions is brought to you by Creature Caster, renowned for making some of the world's most beautiful and detailed miniatures. Along with the Gunmeister Games team, they are reimagining the world of Judgment, its characters and its universe. After five years of Judgment version 1, comes the evolved rules and gameplay of Judgment Eternal Champions. Join the battle with the starter sets on Kickstarter with exclusive miniatures and accessories only available during this campaign. These sets are of incredible value and the gateway into the Judgment universe. Starter sets come with a plethora of game pieces to make for an immersive and exciting experience with options to upgrade that experience with 3D terrain and tokens. 
Judgment Eternal Champions, what path to victory will you take? By my axe, I shall conquer the battlefield. How will you become an eternal champion? 